Hi, and welcome to another episode of Practical Welding Television. I'm your host, Amanda Carlson. We're back here in the classroom with Mike and Larry from Rock Valley College for part one of our two-part series on oxyacetylene welding. So we're gonna focus on oxyacetylene welding today. Uh, Mike, what kind of materials and, and specifically material thicknesses do you find this sort of welding and cutting in? Well, with my experience, we use uh, oxyacetylene and these, this type of torch for uh, when you're gas welding, uh, thinner materials, such as mild, thin mild steel. Uh, we use uh, very commonly uh, 16 gauge on up to in the vicinity of you know, 11 gauge material that we uh, weld with the oxyacetylene process. Um, when you get into thicker materials, it can be done with this process, but other processes uh, are much more efficient and, and quicker. Okay, now as welding instructors here at Rock Valley College, um, how much oxyacetylene welding do you teach? And if you teach it, what, why is it important? We're teaching it to our beginners. Um, it, the students develop a real good uh, skill and hand-eye coordination by using this process. And we like to start out people, uh, the students, by using this process because it really develops those skills quickly. Mm -hmm. Now when I was at Hobart Institute for Welding Technology a couple years ago for their welder, welding for the non-welder class, uh, oxyacetylene welding was the first thing that we learned. Um, and I thought it really set the groundwork for me, especially when we moved toward TIG welding. Uh, I mean, would, would you agree with that, Larry? I know it's kind of a primitive form of TIG welding, but still it's, it's, a, it's a valuable skill to learn. Yes, it's very valuable because it is a primitive, like you said, it, because it's so slow. But it's one of the things that a student has to know and has to learn the eye-hand coordination and watching the torch, watching the filler rod, watching the puddle, and making sure that they move in the right speed so they don't ruin the piece of metal that they're working on. Okay. Mike, talk to me about the equipment here. We've got lots of torches, we've got cords, we've got goggles, and we've got cylinders. What, what, what we got going on here? Well, as far as the torches go, we have uh, a couple different varieties here. Uh, this is a cutting torch used for cutting, uh, cutting steel. Then we move to some smaller torches here, which are used for the actual gas welding themselves. And here are a couple different versions okay. here. Uh, the uh, placement of the valves, uh, some people uh, feel that that is extremely important. This is called an aviation type welding torch. Um, and this is uh, about a me medium sized uh, gas welding torch. Uh, we can, there are some larger uh, torches that actually take some very large uh, tips. Mm -hmm. uh, this really isn't used too much anymore uh, for welding just because, like I said before, there are other processes that are uh, much more efficient. This is a heating uh, tip called a rosebud that attaches to the torch. It's used to heat up metal uh, very quickly. It puts out an enormous amount of heat. Now you got a, a red hose and you got a green hose. What do, what do those mean? Uh, the two different hoses uh, separate the two gases. We have uh, oxygen and acetylene. The uh, oxygen hose is color-coded green always, and the fuel gas uh, or acetylene hose is color-coded red. Also, the fittings are different, uh, so you can't get them uh, interchange. They, they won't interchange, you can't get them mixed up. The uh, fittings for the oxygen are right-hand threads. The fittings for the acetylene are left-hand threads. Another way to identify it is a little uh, groove that's machined in, into the, uh, the fitting. Okay. You can't hook them up backwards. Now, what kind of uh, personal protective equipment do welders need? It's, it's not the full, full mask that we're used to seeing for uh, arc welding processes. It's more of, because the process isn't, isn't as bright, correct? Exactly. The, uh, the eye protection is different. Uh, you only uh, really need to have a uh, gas welding goggles, and these come in uh, different uh, uh, choices of size and uh, different designs, uh, but they all should have a, a number uh, five uh, lens in them, okay. shade five lens. In them. You use, normally use light uh, duty welding gloves. Like TIG gloves? Rather, yes, these are, are TIG gloves, but they're very good uh, for gas welding because they're so very, very flexible. Here we have a striker uh, that's used to ignite the, ignite the flame. 
And we have a tip cleaner here, which is used to uh, clean uh, impurities that may get stuck on the tip or in the orifice, mm -hmm. which obstructs the, the gas flow. So we use tip cleaner to clean that, clean that out. We have uh, check valves here, which uh, are they're a safety uh, valve that are put in line to allow gas flow in one direction only. That way, uh, when one pressure or one gas pressure is higher than the other, it won't travel back up the other hose. Um, here we have a safety cap. This goes over the tank valve itself. When the regulator is not attached to it, that safety uh, cap should always be on it. Uh, what it does, it protects that valve in case the, the tank were to fall over. We don't want this uh, valve to get ruptured. And if that were to happen, there's an uh, enormous amount of pressure inside these tanks when they're full. The oxygen is over 2,000 pounds per square inch, and the acetylene is around 250 pounds per square inch pressure. But if the valve were to be ruptured, this tank becomes a missile, and it will go through a cement block wall very easily. Okay, and is there a special way that you need to um, align the tanks or secure them so that you make sure, so they're not gonna fall, there's no chance of that? Right, uh, having the tanks secured is extremely important because you don't want the tanks falling out. Here we actually have uh, two devices on here. We have it uh, secured by this uh, bracket that was made. We also have them chained, mm -hmm. uh, chained to, the, to the cart. So when we move, uh, transport it around, uh, it's, we know that it's safe and the tanks are not gonna fall out. I'm gonna be honest, Larry, this process makes me nervous. And I think it's because a lot of times you see in the newspaper and online, you see these stories about uh, shops exploding because people were very careless with the equipment. I mean, what, what in your experience have you seen that, that coincides with that? Well, if you operate this equipment properly and in a safe manner, you won't have no problem. And this is where safety becomes the, the most important part. When I first went in the Navy, um, I was assigned a fire watch. Now fire watch is I have a fire extinguisher to carry around for an old guy that was gonna do welding. And I said, the most boring job in the whole world. And I, day after day after day, but it was the most important one. When we did welding, I had to make sure there was no sparks, no fire came out of it. I stayed a half hour afterwards to make sure no fire, then I was done. You have to have your work area clean. You have to have it. It's a known fact that sparks will travel 35 feet or more. If any combustible areas or material is around in that area, you have to have somebody watching it or you have to clean it out away from where you're working at. Because once you start cutting, you've got your goggles down, you can't see all the sparks, the little hot piece of metal that'll roll across the floor, get up against some paper or other material and start your fire then. Safety is a big factor in this, especially with acetylene. Uh, it just, uh, the sparks will go, uh, it's a hot process, and it can catch anything on fire. Mike here is going to take us through on how to get this started, Mike. What we want to do, we want to turn the tanks on. What I uh, recommend students do is uh, turn that the oxygen on, or both gases on, slowly to begin with. So what we want to do is, uh, first of all, position yourself in a safe uh, position. I recommend that you stand on the opposite side of the regulator. So we have the tank, the regulator, stand on this side. Regulators have been known to uh, explode. And normally when that does happen, they will go usually in, um, forward. So you don't want to stand in front looking at the gauges, even though it's uh, a human nature to stand and watch, watch the gauges. When we initially turn them on, we want to stand to the side. So what I'm going to do is turn the oxygen on real slowly to begin with. Now I can see that our uh, first gauge indicates how much uh, is how much pressure is in the tank. We have right now almost 2,200 pounds. So this is a full tank. Now I'm going to uh, turn the valve open all the way, which is called back seating the valve that prevents uh, any oxygen from leaking out. The acetylene, I open that anywhere from a quarter to a half a turn, no more than one full turn, opening it up slowly also. 
and I can see that right now we have approximately 140 pounds of pressure in the tank. So the tank is, has got, uh, is, is fairly full. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to adjust the pressures up, take the pressures that are in the tank, they have to be regulated down to a working pressure for the torch, which is much lower than the pressure that's in the regulator right now. So what I'm going to do is, uh, first of all, I'm going to crack open the oxygen valve. I'm going to adjust the oxygen up to approximately five PSI. That's a recommendation, recommend, recommended pressure for, for this torch. I'm all, now I'm gonna shut the valve, and I'm going to crack the acetylene valve, and I'm gonna adjust it up to approximately five PSI. And that's the second gauge that I'm looking at. Come up to five, no, I close the valve. Now, both are uh, properly adjusted for the pressures recommended for, for this torch and, and tail. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead and light the torch. So I have the, the flint striker. I need to crack open the acetylene valve about maybe an eighth of a turn, no more. I put the striker out in front and on an angle, and I strike it, and there's my flame. Now I need to adjust the acetylene flame. So when it's get a feather and the smoke starts to stop, then, or the soot begins to stop, then I bring on the oxygen slowly and I adjust the flame to what's called a neutral flame. See the outer cone just disappears into the inner cone and that's what is called a neutral flame and that's where I would normally weld uh, our, our metals with that flame. Now there are two other types of flames that we have. A carburizing flame is an excess of acetylene and see how the uh, the cone extends out, the feather. That's called uh, carburizing flame or reducing flame. A little bit softer, a little bit uh, cooler flame. Back to a neutral flame. Now if we have an oxidizing flame, which is an excess of oxygen, the inner cone becomes very sharp and it kind of sounds like a jet engine and we don't want that sound. That's too much oxygen. Now we reduce it back to what's called a neutral flame. And that's the flame that is, uh, we normally uh, use for gas welding and, and brazing and, and soldering. Now to shut the torch off, close the acetylene. This tor torch manufacturer recommends turn the acetylene valve off first, then the oxygen. Now, once we're uh, finished welding, we want to go home for the day, we need to uh, turn the equipment off and shut it down and, and drain it. So we turn both tanks off completely. Turn the oxygen valve all the way off till it stops. And I turn the acetylene valve on the tank off until it stops. Now I'm going to drain the hoses because now we have gas trap from here all the way through to the torch. I want to drain that out and we'll watch the gauges drain to zero. First I'm going to open up the uh, oxygen valve on the torch and we'll watch both gauges drop to zero. And you can hear it coming out. Once they've reached zero, then I again close the torch valve lightly, back out the adjustment screw. All right, open up the acetylene torch valve, watch both gauges drop to zero. Turn the torch valve off, back the adjustment screw out so it's e really easy to turn. And then we wind up the hose and that's all there is to it. Now if you're looking for more information on oxyacetylene, whether it be cutting, welding, brazing, or soldering, uh, check us out on our website, www.thefabricator.com. Next time, you won't want to miss it. We're going to be in the lab, and we're going to take some of the elements that we learned here in the classroom and apply them. I want to give a special thanks to Rock Valley College and Mike and Larry, as always. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.